This following Everson Boys podcast is sponsored by Martin Roach Consultancy. Martin Roach Consultancy offers a digital marketing service raising awareness of brand services and selling products via Google, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn advertising. Martin has over 10 years experience in digital marketing and has run multi-million pound European accounts for the likes of Apple, Jaguar and Honda but also has a passion for helping startup businesses and small and medium enterprises. You can contact them via email at martin at martinroachconsultancy.co.uk. Welcome to the first episode of the Emerson Boys podcast, where we're talking about football, mental health, Wigan, what's going on there. Uh, my football academies that I'm looking to set up in England and in Barbados. But the Emerson Boys Foundation, which I'm really, really excited about. Racism, the Black Lives Matter, and my own experiences re- regarding racism. And of course, the news that broke yesterday. I've come out of retirement and I signed for Mark Hayes' Ashton Town. The Barbados sweat band is ready. Boots have been dusted off and number 17 is ready to go again. But first, let me introduce you to my co-host, a young entrepreneur who's making an impact in the journalism world the founder of Wigan Mental Health uh, Group, and he's only 21 years old. I'd like to introduce you to Jay Whittle. How you doing, Jay? You right? I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and it's going to be a great podcast to uh, bring to people because it's not only going to look at a side of footballs you've probably never seen before, but it's a great platform to, for young footballers to, to learn and grow and have a bit of coaching online in terms of improving the game, developing and transitioning into maybe one day, one day being a Premier League footballer. So it's going to be a great podcast, and I'm sure it'll be a great listen to every fan. Yeah, great. You know, um, obviously, like anything, it's, it's, the fans are very important. Um, you know, obviously, like myself, you know, trying to connect with the fans is, you know, I only realise it more now that I've finished football. Um, I realise how important fans are. Uh, as a player, sometimes you just treat it as a job. You know, you just do your job and go home. But, you know... The situation at Wigan and everything that's going on in the world today, realise, you know, without, fa- without fans, football is nothing. Absolutely. I think the pandemic's really emphasised that. I saw an interview after the Champions League final with Ander Herrera, and he, he practically said football without fans is absolutely rubbish in a more, less polite way. And I think it emphasises the need of fans. At the moment, every stadium in the world is like the stadium behind me, empty. And I think the sooner the fans get into the stadium again in October, potentially, the better. And during these times at Way Athletic, the players, staff and need the fans more than ever. So to not able to be there and support them and have to do things online it has been really difficult in an already tough situation. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's why I did this um, the first podcast. I wanted yourself on as a fan. Um, I think it's very important um, to get that connection. Um, you know, for myself, when I was doing the, the radio in a radio broadcast in some of the some of the games um, that was going on in the Wigan Stadium, you know, it hit me. You know, it got me missing the game again, um, and I wanted to give something back. And hence, obviously, a lot of people well, yesterday heard the news that I um, signed for Ashton Town. Um, Mark Hayes is a, a fantastic man. Um, you know, he's got a, a great heart, and he's done so much for Joseph Goal. Um, and I felt like I needed to, you know, to help him in some sort of way. Um, we had a conversation and it's funny enough, he just briefly mentioned to me about playing for Ashton Town in a, in a new season coming up. And you should saw his face when I said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> did, did you kind of think he was having a childhood dream come true? Because obviously Ashton Town has some great players over the years. They've had Pascal Chimbonda play for him in the 2018 to 19 season. And now yourself joining, and the news of you joining Ashton Town has definitely broken social media almost. It's been the talk of the town, and you must be so excited to start this new adventure. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, as I say, I think it was more tongue-in-cheek when he asked me. Um, and then, as I was to say, his, his face when I said, yeah, um, you know, it was, uh, I sure took a picture. But as I said, you know, he's done so much work for Joseph Goal, and I said to him, any time you want me to do you any sort of favour whatsoever, let me know. And, um, you know, this is the, the best way of paying them back in terms of that side of it. And, you know, it's, it's nice to give something positive back to the town of, of Wigan at this minute in time where, you know, the talk is very much doom and gloom and obviously what's happening at the DW Stadium. 
But for me, you know, to go down and, and put my boots back on, um, my first training sessions this week. So I'm looking forward to that, meet my new teammates. And you know what, you know, I always get advice and, and former players always used to tell me, you know, play as much as you can um, until you physically can't. And, um, you know, obviously I'm getting older now and, you know, but my leg's still working and I feel good and my passion, my drive's coming back. And, um, yeah, I feel like um, I can contribute. Obviously, I've got to get into the team first, so nothing's a given. And, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I think um, at the non-league level, fans are allowed to come back, which which will be great for, that, for the club. And, you know, I, I miss that playing in front of fans again. So, yeah, it's going to be a, a, a good challenge for me. Um, and, yeah, I'll, it'll be hard for me to get into the team. But, hey, it's a, a challenge I'm re- ready to take. What position are you hoping to play for Ashton Town? I know you, you played operated as a right back for most of your career. You play centre back, more than capable. Where do you think you'll play, or, or do you think you'll be on the bench? Striker. Striker. <laughs> I know you started your career in your youth days as a striker. Yeah, it's full full circle. Now I you know I think I'll be playing. Um, I don't know. You have to, have, to, have to ask the manager where he wants to play. Wants to play me. Um, as I said, you know I'm just looking forward to giving my experience to some of the players that are there. Um, you know, and for me is to give something back and. You know, that's what it's all about. You know, so many ex-players want to give something back to the game. And thankfully, I've got an opportunity to do so now. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to the challenge ahead. I know Mark's absolutely buzzing regarding it. And, and as you said, social media's going. My phone's been ringing non-stop. <laughs> I've got more attention now than I did when I signed for Wigan. <laughs> so, <laughs> that tells I, you something. <laughs> I think it, it's really nice to hear you say you'd like to give something back as a player, especially after your career. Is this also what you're going to try to do with your academy and your foundation in Barbados to hopefully give back to the fans that supported you and help them with their careers? Because obviously you've got vast experience at the top level of English football. You've won the FA Cup with Wigan Athletic. You play in the Europa League. You're an international for Barbados. So they're definitely learning for someone who's more than capable in the football industry, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm setting up my academy now in, in the Wigan and Northwest area. Uh, I've been coaching for a couple of months now and and, and the joy I see on, on, on the kids' faces and the, the adults' faces when we're coaching them is, is, is magnificent. You know, that's what gives me the buzz um, to giving something back. Uh, Neil Rim has been helping me do the coaching. Um, and it's a, it is a case of, you know, we've been coaching ladies' teams, men's teams, kids' teams, uh, ex-pros that, or current pros that are coming out just trying to get their fitness back. And, you know, it's just... Being back on the grass again, got my boots back on, and, and it's given me a you know a lot of satisfaction regarding that side of it. And it's always good to talk about your 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 career. You know, I can never stop talking about obviously the FA Cup, but it's more than that. You know, what made what got me there in the first place from my days at Luton as an apprentice, making my way up from League Two, League One, Championship to the Premier League, um, and then Europa League to international football. So. There's a lot of lot of um, you know experience and information I'm giving back to the younger generation, which is which is fantastic for me. And obviously, like anything, I'm I'm trying to do the academy in Wigan. Um, base going to be based originally um, start start off with in Wigan, and then I'm hoping in in January February we'll be launching one in Barbados. Um, at the moment, I'm helping uh, the Barbados Football Association with the women's game. Um, you know, the challenges they, they face over there. You know, people talk about it in England. So you can imagine over in Barbados where, you know, the challenge is quite harder, shall I say. But, you know, I'm a positive guy. You know, I always believe in change. And, um, you know, I'm really, really looking forward to, to doing that project um, in Barbados. What sort of challenges do women face in Barbados in terms of football? Um, it's very, very, at this minute in time, um, on the male side, um, you know, obviously the Barbados national team hasn't got a great track record of, of making to a major tournament if they have made it to a major tournament. So obviously all the focus at the moment is on the on the men's team to try and progress, which they're doing really, really well. This national, this nation league's done um, exceptionally well for them because, you know, when I used to play, we used to play against the Trinidad's and, and the bigger countries, you know, the USA, which rally of all is, you know, we haven't really got much chance against them. But now we play against teams that are, are, are more our level, countries more our level. And it gives us a, a, a great foundation to build from. So, um, yeah, so the women's game is exactly the same. Um, you know, technically they need a bit more improving. But 
it's like anything, you know, once you give them the recognition they deserve, you know, it will come on leaps and bounds. Absolutely. And in this country, in the United Kingdom, the women's game is continuously to grow. It's getting more popular and hopefully the same initiative could spread in Barbados. And having someone like yourself figurehead that would be great for the country and everyone involved in Barbados. In terms of your academy, how are you, you planning to implement it in the United Kingdom? What can children learn when they come to your academy? And what are you going to offer for people, not just in football, but outside of football too? I think a lot of it, you know, will be technical based. Um, we're looking to set up a BTEC for next September, so 2021. Um, in a, it'll be based in Wigan again. Um, and it'll be a case of you know, how can we bridge that grassroots level to uh, a professional academy? Um, there's so many talented, talented players that can't get into a t uh, academies this minute in time. Um, whether they're not technically up to scratch or just the opportunities. And we're looking to create as many pathways as we can um, in England and in Barbados. Exactly the same stories in Barbados where there's so many talented, talented players, but there's no real pathway. So part of my academy will be trying to create those pathways to give the, the players the technical ability to, when they do go on trial to uh, an academy or a football team, they've got the tools already to try and um, impress. Uh, rather than trying to you know, catch up and learn um, as they go along. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic challenge for me. Um, we've got some great people working on it. And, you know, I've been speaking to the, prime, uh, the all the ministers over in Barbados. The prime ministers gave it a, a great feedback as well. So this all links into my foundation, where the Emerson Boys Foundation is about to set up in Barbados, where we're looking to um, help the local communities. Um, we've got e-learning. We've got... You know, for me, education is very, very important. You know, I've been privileged and lucky enough to play football. But um, when I was 16, I didn't do too good at my GCSEs. And, um, yeah, it was a case of, you know, looting. I was one of the last people to get my contract. So it was about three weeks after everybody else. And um, for that three weeks, I was scratching my head thinking, what am I going to do with myself? And, you know, it was a shock to my system. And as I'm going along now and looking at the academies and, and people are trying to get into academies, you know, I think it's very, very important to give them the education back, um, the base where football is not the be or end all. You know, I'm, I'm 40 years old now and I'm still learning. You know, I'm, I'm taking, I'm doing my business, um, a business course and trying to do as many courses as I can. So if you can do it when you're 16 and, and throughout your football career, um, if you do go into football or anything in general, then it gives you a, a great platform to, if injuries or anything comes along, that you can um, sell out at something else as well. Is it really important to give young players an opportunity and a bit of a contingency plan, say, if they suffered an injury, that life isn't over after the football career is over? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go to my experience at Luton Town, where we had this, uh, Steve Augustin, his name, and he was, I think he was 17 at the time, he had the world at his feet. He was absolutely, he was absolutely a fantastic footballer. Everything you want in a footballer, he had. And one reserve game, um, you know, he broke his leg. You know, I can remember it to this day. And, and that was his career finish. You know, and at 17 year, years old, he had all the potential in the world. But he never got to fulfil it because of injuries. And, you know, you, you see it now in, in the footballing world. You know, one injury is one... You know, we always get that saying. One injury is a step away from... Um, a career end, a career ended. You know, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to go through my career without no serious injuries, and but there's not not many. Well, there's a lot of people who haven't been as fortunate. So yeah, for me, education is very important, not just in football, but as I say, I'm doing this foundation in Barbados where we are looking to um, to educate the local community, um, not so much the community, but obviously the kids that are coming through um, about lifestyle lifestyle skills. Um, Everything, you know, Janie Frampton's doing a program for me who who has done a magnificent uh, job regarding doing the program with learning. And we are trying to create pathways through media, through everything possible we are trying to create. So it's an exciting project ahead and fingers crossed that it'll be successful. I think this is really exciting. And obviously with Barbados, it's a country that is really close to your heart. You took Dave Whelan there, I recall, a few years ago and I think it's going to be great to see the progress of the academy and the academy and the foundation progress will be tracked on this podcast too. So I know if anyone has a vested interest in Barbados and seeing what's going on, what we do with the podcast, well, 
we're going to expose you to that and you'll get to get to know some of the kids we'll be working with and it'll be a really nice project for them and I think this will be for the kids now Emerson with the the managers you've worked with throughout your career you've worked with some top names Roberto Martinez Steve Bruce just to name a few what's the greatest bit of advice you received as a player um, the greatest piece of advice was, um, I think it was from Ian Dowie. Uh, he was my manager at Crystal Palace. Um, I know, I hold him in high regards. He just said, work hard. You know, all he, all he says is put 100% into it. You know, I, you know, people think it's a given, but he just said, you know, I wasn't the most talented player. I wasn't the most technically gifted, but what I did do is work hard. And he just told me to work hard, you know, work hard as you can at the, what you're good at and everything else will fall in, fall in place. And, you know, lucky enough, I've, I've managed to get from my career like that. Um, I just believe in hard work, keep working on your weaknesses. Um, and, you know, Roberto Martinez was a, another manager, forward thinking. Um, he just kept saying, pass it simple. You know, just keep, as, as you know, as easy as it says, just pass it simple. The first picture is the, the best picture. And, you know, we still, we still hear that message all the way down to the academy level. But when you get to the highest level, um, and it is about how simple you do it. Um, you look at Man City, Liverpool, there's possible simple. Barcelona, everything's simple. And, you know, you know, and that's, and that's all give you, if you can uh, control the ball and pass the ball, it'll give you a great study in the game. Absolutely. I think the fundamental skills of football, such as passing, dribbling, shooting, is something that'll be learned in the academy. But I think it's very important that you don't overcomplicate football because I know some tactics can get a bit too advanced and, I think it is sometimes the best policy just to play the simple pass, play the first pass. And obviously teaching that in your academy will be really successful. In terms of your playing career, you've played for some great teams. Luton Town, where you start your career, moving on to Crystal Palace with Yendawi. And then before you joined Wing Athletic, you spent nine years out there at the football club, becoming a club legend amongst the town. You're still held in really high regard. And at the moment at Wing Athletic, a club where you won the FA Cup, you famously carried out Joseph Kendry in the photograph behind you. And at the moment, things aren't looking so rosy uh, for the football club. It's been a really torrid time. From an outsider looking in, I know you've commentated on BBC Radio Manchester games. How's it like for you as a fan to see what's been going on? Yeah, it's um, a sad state of affairs. Um, obviously, I've, I've done quite a lot of interviews um, from Talk Sport to you know, BBC uh, Manchester to the, the TVs. Um, you know, it's unfortunate Wig Wigan's found himself in this situation. You know, if, when I left the club, you'd never even imagine, you know, how Wigan would have ended up um, in this way. You know, winning the FA Cup, playing Europa League, playing at Wembley. You know, David Williams left left a legacy that's there. And, you know, to see how Wigan has fallen is a, a sad state of affairs. Um, well, I'm just I'm just praying this minute in time that um, an investor will come. Uh, I know there's the, I think there's a deadline tomorrow. Um, well, hopefully we'll hear some news on on Monday, but it will be a case of um, um, yeah, an investor comes in, stabilise the club, and we can we can move forward. Um, I, I know you're going to touch on it in a minute, but you know, you know Caroline and the support of the club, you know, have actually done a, a, amazing, and that just shows you the worth of fans. Um, at every single football or football stadium, you know, without without fans, the football club is, is nothing. And um, you know, for me, you know, the fans have actually done a magnificent. You know, raising money, um, putting their, you know, especially in this pandemic, this minute in time, putting their hands in their pockets and and contributing, it's absolutely been amazing. Lisa Nandy as well, you know, she's been fantastic leading the baton. Um, and it was nice. I was on a a, a previous show, and. It was nice. Obviously, she is very much determined to make sure Wiggins, um, you know, survive. And she's leading the band. She's leading, asking those questions. And it was nice to hear her talking about her football experience. You know, obviously, when she went and watched the FA Cup and seeing her smiling, because obviously, like anything, this is a stressful time for many people. And you know, it was it was it's more than you know. As I say before, you know, Wigan Wigan needs to be survived, and hopefully, a vessel will come in and and survive um, and stabilize the club. Absolutely, and I think the fans have been, like you say, magnificent. magnificent. And uh, I don't know what, what I was trying to say then. And it's been quite overwhelming to see the support we've had. At the moment in time, Jonathan Jackson, the former chief executive, and Caroline Molyneux of the support club have been doing a fan-led campaign known as Save Our Club. And in little over 
three days, they've raised over £300,000 for this campaign to own a stake in the football club. And I think this is a really massive opportunity for fans to have a major say in their club and obviously dictate their future as a football club. And the amount of former players that have helped out too has been really nice to see. Jamie Jones, a current player, he's donated. Callum McManaman, someone you know, you know really well, he donated over two grand. And James McLean, someone you play with in your later days at like Athletic, has donated five grand. And to see gestures like that, it just makes you realise how special like Athletic is. During your time at the club, does this kind of surprise you to see how the fans rally together? No, not really. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be a trustee on uh, the Wigan Community Trust, and the work they do in the community is absolutely amazing. And, you know, it, it goes to highlight, you know, even in this pandemic, the struggles that are going on this minute in time, how the fans have rallied together, um, you know, obviously last season, you know, raised that much money just to make sure Wigan see out the season. And, and, this, year, and this year they're doing exactly the same. Obviously, players, former players, you know, affiliated to the club, they, they want to contribute, they want to help. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a strange situation that Wigan find themselves in. You know, but like anything, I'm a positive person. I think an investor will come in and, and save the club. The, it, I think it's only right for the fans to have a, a stake, you know, some sort of a seat at the board. Um, you know, I just finished doing my governance um, course with the affected board member through the PFA. And, you know, you don't realise how important it is to have other voices on that board to actually know what's going on. You know, one day I might be at the, you know, myself will be applying for a board, a board role at, at a club. You know, maybe at Wigan, but um, you know, for me, it's, it's important for fans to have, have a say in the club, um, to actually know what's going on and to avoid situations what's going on this minute in time. Absolutely, I think the situation we're in at the moment has highlighted how much this club means to people, and at this moment in time, the club's future is so in jeopardy. It kind of taught fans to not take your football club for granted. I think often football goes quite unnoticed that you don't really appreciate it as much as you probably should until you realise that you could lose it. And I think it makes you cherish all those special memories even more. You played a big part in some of Wigan fans' greatest ever days, the FA Cup final being the one everyone talks about the most. And obviously as well, this time of administration has a direct impact on fans' mental health. You've been a great advocate for mental health over the years. And can you relate to how fans are feeling on terms of a mental health point of view that the fact that they distress that not only the club may not exist, but they may lose their escape from the demons, because football is a lot of people's social hub and way they can make new friends and connect. Yeah, and, and it's great credit to yourself. You know, were you 21 years of age and you set up a mental health group in the uh, for the Wigan fans? <clears throat> and um, yeah, it's um, for me. You know, it is important. You know, obviously I went from my football career with of social anxiety, which people didn't really know about. Um, I hate talking in groups and, you know, I always get the sweat so I'm nervous. And, um, yeah, it's a, when I was made captain, that was a, a big, big, you know, for me, it was, it was massive in terms of trying to, um, trying to get over that, that side of it, that barrier for me. And the groups like this, what I realised the most, you know, when I finished playing football, I went and saw a counsellor. Um, I talked through my social anxiety, um, what was holding me back in my playing days. And she just said, you know, the main thing is to talk. Um, there's a, such a big stigma, especially amongst men, that, you know, if you talk, it's a sign of weakness, which when you realise and, and actually think about it, it's nonsense. Um, and it is about being brave sometimes, but groups like that, the, what you set up yourself, you know, it gives everybody a platform. I, for myself, I put a couple of videos in there, a um, couple of t um, um, tweets and texts, and the response has been um, fantastic. You know, you're hearing people's stories, their challenges. Um, I've had a couple of friends who have, you know, have went through hard times themselves, through depression and, and other issues. So it, it sort of opens my eyes. And, and for me to have a, a little bit of an impact, not as big of an impact as yourself, because, you know, what you're doing for the, for, the, for the group is magnificent, you know, especially your days out, which you, I'm more than sure you'll talk about in a minute. But um, it's given people a platform to talk about, to talk to, and, and everybody's got an ear and everybody's listening. I think a lot of the times with mental health, it, it's just a case of some people just want someone to listen to their stories. And at the moment, like you touched upon, with mental health, it includes our emotional, psychological and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, 
and it also helps determine how we act in certain situations and and at the moment there's quite a big stigma around it in terms of the assumptions people make about mental health and how it affects a person and I think groups like this are really immeasurable in terms of breaking the stigma down because I think that the easiest way you can tackle stigma is by talking to people about their experiences, listening to the story and just simply remembering that mental health is just a small part of the person and the group we've had at Wing Athletic at the moment has been really inspirational to see the fans rally together and provide a support unit within because I feel like there's a real place for this in football at the moment because in events of trauma and tragedy there's no real support system and I know EFL have a partnership with the charity Mind and I feel like this should be explored further and the biggest sign we've had is that we've made sure that our mental health group is not just a place where it's a friendly face and the thing that connects people is that we've all got the same common interests. We're all different in terms of financial background, uh, current situations, our own upbringings, but we're all the same for our love of way athletic. And, and that's what makes it so easy for people to open up and talk about things. And in our group, it's a safe space where people can open up if they choose to. There's no pressure for people to open up either because we understand that people may not be willing to talk about their mental health because I know it is quite a scary prospect. But I think once the conversation starts, it opens up the doors for other people to find the bravery to talk as well. Because I know you mentioned social anxiety. I also suffer with social anxiety. I hate talking in front of big groups or, or any group situation. I always feel a bit nervous. I can relate to getting sweaty palms and, and feeling dead overwhelmed. So <clears throat> it's just conversations like this. It, it kind of helps bring out other conversations about mental health. At the moment in our group, we've had over 300 members join across Facebook, WhatsApp and Twitter. And most of those members are actually male, which is a massive victory because the stigma attached to male is, males is, is so much higher because they do see it as a sign of weakness. Because in a workplace, traditionally, if a man does open up about his mental health, he's simply told to man up. And this is not right. We want to end this. And, and I think we'll go a long way in doing that. We host regular group meetings as well. We had our first one on the Tuesday, September 19th at the Brickmakers Arms in Wigan. The fans really enjoyed themselves. They had a, a Q&A uh, with each other. They had a few icebreakers. We did a bit of a quiz and a game of Lassic's A to Z. And in the quiz, you was even the tiebreaker, Emerson. Which <laughs> players made the most Premier League appearances for Athletic? It was indeed Emerson Boyce. And I think just groups like this help put a smile on people's faces because it's an opportunity to make new friends, enjoy yourself and, and relate with the common interests of football. I think football is a great platform to, to spread views of mental health across because mental health affects one in four people in the United Kingdom. It's one of the biggest silent killers in the world. And if we could come together to help solve an issue of the stigma surrounding mental health, then we'll go a long way in, in making the world a lot better place. It's quite hostile at the moment with social media. And like yourself, you're a, you're a group ambassador, which we really appreciate. And as well, for, for fans who are intrigued to get involved with a mental health group, all the details are on our Twitter page, at WAS Mental Health. So it's really important if you'd like to get involved, anyone's welcome to join. And also, if you feel like you need a bit more than a friendly face to talk to, we have got professionals in place as informal counsellors. So they we've got two counsellors at the moment with over 60 years combined experience as mental health nurse and Ken Barlow he's worked as a mental health nurse since 1972 uh, recently yeah. retired Alan Broxton in a similar position so we've actually had two situations where fans have had to need to speak to a more professional outlook and they have received the help they need so it's having a real positive impact and if you'd like to be a part of that we would like to welcome you with an open arms and, and Emerson do you believe that this could be an opportunity for football to change for good with projects like this? Yeah, 100%. And, and that's why I felt it was so important to get the first episode of the, the Emerson Boys podcast as a, a more of a fan, a, a player to a fan. Um, it, was, it was quite easy to get other players on board and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, with Wigan going through the situation this minute in time, I thought though the first episode would be fitting, you know, to have a fan on as yourself. And if going out talking about mental health and, and that side of it as well. Groups like yourself, how do they how do they join? How how would they be able to join your group if they wanted to join? So if anyone likes to join the group, if you go on our Twitter page, there's open links to both Facebook and WhatsApp. On WhatsApp we have 110 members where everyone openly discusses whether it's mental health or just a bit of gossip about football, 
anything's welcome in that group chat. We've we've got our Twitter page. So on the weekends, which we've currently had, we encourage people to do a little bit of a challenge. We've uh, done a bit of research. I've co- recently completed a mental health course to educate myself further about this. And it's been proven that exercise has a direct impact on mental health because it helps reduce stress. Uh, it improves sleep at night because obviously as you're tired, it's easier to get to sleep. And it, and it also improves physical health. I know there was an issue of obesity locally and in the United Kingdom. So if we can combat together to improve physical and mental health, then it's a win-win all rounds really. And we just want to help as many people as we can. In this life at the moment, um, there's a lot of negative atmospheres. It can be quite a hostile place. We've we've seen a lot of people affected my, my mental health. Early in yeah. 2020, Caroline Flack, uh, obviously a famous figure, host of Love Island. She sadly took her own life. And I think that emphasised the need. One of her sayings were, if, if you're going to be anything, be kind. And I think that's what our motto is as well. Let's be kind to one another and let's look out for one another. Yeah, definitely. I think kindness is is the key question, uh, a key answer. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be an ambassador of Street Soccer USA, um, a homeless organisation in based in New York. Um, and the biggest, the biggest, um, you know, the biggest, not in question, but the biggest thing people used to say to me when I went and saw them and, and stuff like that, it said it doesn't make a difference about money. It's the fact that you're thinking about us and, and you're coming to join playing football and, you know, spending an, a few hours with them. That's all they cared about, you know, and that's and that tells you even about the about your group. It's not about how much money you got. It's not about how much, you know, what what your background is. It's about a, a common place where everybody come and just be free and, and express themselves and can talk about their problems, their issues. And what I found a lot is, you know, when you start talking, you start relating to other people. And when you start relating to other people, you realise you're not by yourself. And this is the biggest, um, for me, this is the biggest, you know, the winning of, the, of any sort of group that, you know, more you talk, more you can share your experiences, more you can impact other people as well because suddenly you're giving other people a light to shine as well and, and be free to share their issues, their problems, their fears with yourself as well. So it is a case of, you know, you, you're taking, you're inspiring others to, to, to share their problems, which is uh, amazing. So fair, gra- fair play to you um, regarding the group side of it. Um, obviously, 21 years of old, 20 years of age, and you're uh, a forward-thinking person who's set up a group, taking this great responsibility. Um, keep up the good work, or what I've got to say about that. Thank you very much for that. And, and it's great to see your support of the initiative. I know mental health is something that is close to everyone's hearts, and it's close to yours too. When you was retiring from football, obviously you've come out of retirement now to play Fashion Town. How difficult was it on a mental health point of view to go from playing football every week and transition out of that routine? Yeah, and, and this is a, this is a, one of the points that I'm gonna I make quite quite good as well regarding former players coming onto the episodes and on the podcast regarding that side of it uh, because you know transition is is quite hard. You know, from 16 years old, I've been doing football, um, and I retired. I was lucky enough to retire at 36. Um, so that's a long chunk of my life that was just based on football, routine, knowing what I'm doing every single day, going and playing in front of thousands and thousands of fans, um, being in, the, in change rooms. And then suddenly when you finish football, um, everything changes. You know, I was going through divorce at the time as well, so which was a strain. You're, you're thinking about where you're going to live, um, what you're going to do with your life, what you're going to do with your, yourself. You know, and, and that, is, that is quite quite hard. You know, I've, I've been quite lucky. I had a, a good support around me. Um, but, you know, we hear stories quite a lot that players haven't got um, people with the support structure around them. Um, I know the PFA do a, a fantastic job regarding trying to help players make that transition. But it's like anything, you know, as you probably you, you might be aware of yourself, it's, it's making that first step. Um, and, it's, and it comes from within. You know, for a couple of months, I was, you know, thinking what I'm going to do. And then Emil Heskey, you know, I met, I bumped into Emil Heskey in a in a restaurant, and he asked me what I'm doing, and I just said to him, I'm not doing much. And he said, like, you know, we're doing we're we're doing a little training session. Him, um, J. Lloyd Samuel before he passed away, Dean Gore, Nathan Ellerton, and it was our escape. You know, we all retired, but we still love the game, 
and we used to go around and have a little kick around. Um, you know, the standards was very good, I must say. <laughs> Some of the finishing was good. Um, but no, it was, a, it was a pace for us. And it's funny enough, for us, you know, Clinton Morrison, he's on, um, on um, Soccer Saturday on, on, on Sky. You know, I, I bumped into him um, a couple of years back and I asked him what he's doing. And he's just saying, doing a school run, not doing nothing much. Um, and it is a cycle that goes a lot with, with professional footballers or professional athletes when they come out of their own uh, industry where it's not so much of a bridge of gap. You know, we don't really know what you're going to do. So in later episodes, um, I'm definitely going to be touching on that, hearing different players' stories regarding when they retire, what they're doing with themselves. Not just the, the doom and gloom, but the success stories they've also had because a lot of people have come out of football and been very, very successful. But sometimes they might have gone through that certain situation where it is a setback, what they're going to do with themselves to progress to the, ne- to the next stage. And it would be great advice for anyone that's coming out of sport or, or especially football, how to bridge that gap between the transition side of it. I think it's going to be something really interesting for a fan point of view to hear. But also, like you say, as a player point of view, because football is, is something that you've only really ever known from a very young age. And it is hard to step away because... I know some players may feel a bit aggrieved that they had to retire because it's something they miss every day. And is this kind of what made your decision to come out of retirement and join Ashton Town a bit easier? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, I'll, as I said before, you know, people always say to me, play until you can't play no more. Um, and I said, Mark's a, a great guy. And, you know, obviously I'll go down every year playing a charity game for Joseph Goal. And obviously this year we didn't play it and, and it, it got me missing, missing football. And it is a case of just having that conversation with him and he just mentioned to me, just come down and play. I'm back into coaching. I'm doing a bit of commentary in, in the radio side of it. And you miss that buzz. And, and at the moment, I'm, I'm still fit and healthy. I can still run around. Um, and I thought, do you know what? Why not? You know, only a short-term contract. But, you know, I thought, why not? Why not go down and, and, and give my experience to, to other players that are around? And, you know, it'll be, it'll be, for me, it'll be great. It'll be a good closure for me. Um, obviously, I haven't played for a couple of years now, but I've been keeping myself fit. So coming out of retirement wasn't an easy choice. A few clubs have asked me before, and I've always said no. But I needed something to light my fire and my passion. And, and Mark gave me the, the talk. He's a fantastic chairman. He knows how to talk. And as I said, he got Pascal down there last year. And obviously, he's, he's worked his magic and got me down there this year. Absolutely. And Mark Case is a tremendous person. He's, he's raised thousands and thousands of pounds for not only Joseph's goal but various charities and you've been a big part of that you know the Legends game is as a fixture everyone looks forward to and we're going you'll know yourself it, it's a date for everyone's calendar and throughout that time you play with some great players over the years people from your time Roberto Martinez you played alongside who was obviously a manager but but my question to you is now is throughout your career you, you play for some top clubs like I've referenced earlier you play with some top teammates, but what would be your best ever 11 of your former teammates? My best 11? Oh, um, you put me on the spot here. Um, I played some, I played with some fantastic players um, over the years, throughout my whole career. Um, if I'm just going on top of my head now and, and just saying the Wigan players, um, I'll probably have to put, you know, I've had Chris Kirkland, I've Carsten, I feel it. Oh, I'd, I'll probably go Al Habsi, um, purely because he was a great uh, shot stopper, um, and he probably didn't get the recognition he deserved or the farewell he deserved when he left Wigan. Um, and you know he's such a great guy. You know, most, not the most vocal, but he's he's a, a a great great person. And as I say, he kept Wigan in the in the, in the Premier League for you know for many years with with his great saves. So. He will probably go in as as the goalkeeper. Right back, I'll go four at the back. Um, Malcolm Mer- Mario Melchior, um, a Dutch international, played at the highest level um, with with Chelsea Champions League, and you know he, he is a, another fantastic guy. Um, attacking football, a, a fullback, great skill, um, a good leader. So yeah, he'll go as my right back. Uh, the original legend as a centre back, Aaron De Um you know, everything you want in a leader. You know, again, another great, great person. And, and you know, a, a, a leader for on the pitch. He's, he's been obviously been at some clubs. 
but you know, for me, as a you know, I still speak to him now, and even when we're playing in the, in the charity games, he still, you know, still still play at a hundred percent how he used to play as a player. I'd get Maynard Figueroa in there, um, the Honduras international. Um, you know, for his time at Wigan, he was absolutely outstanding. You know, defending. I think his debut was against Manchester United uh, against Ronaldo, and he kept Ronaldo quiet that day. Um, tough tackling, no nonsense defender, but obviously everyone remembers him for that goal he scored from the halfway line against Stoke, which you know has to be one of the goals of you know, the Premier League era, shall I say? He was only young at the time, but Leighton Baines would have been my left back. Um, Baines, he obviously had a, another one that's gone on to you know captain. You know, Captain Everton, I think he played for England. Another great player, fantastic left foot and had a, a great career. My holding midfielder, I'd have put Palacios. Um, for me, everything you want in a midfielder. He's technically very, very good, can tackle, can score goals, got skill. Obviously, he went on and played for Tottenham. Um, but again, you know, another humble guy and, and I always got time for him, you know. I think injury cut his, short, his career a little bit short, but a fantastic, fantastic player. I've gone for attacking uh, formation. Valencia, you know, when he came to Wigan, no one really knew much about him. But, you know, you can see now then he was a very, very gifted player. Again, went on to captain Manchester United to show you his real talent. Um, a strong player, a great winger. Then in, I put Sean Maloney in there. Um, everybody, everybody remembers him for his goal against Manchester United. A very, very clever footballer. Um, always sees a picture, always sees a pass. Um, again, you know, a fantastic guy. Charles Nzogbia on the left side. You know, another player who, for me, didn't quite fulfil his potential. He had all the ability in the world. Um, obviously, he got his move to Aston Villa. But obviously, people remember Matt Wigan for his goals against Arsenal and, and that, mass, uh, that magnificent comeback against West Ham to keep us up. Victor Moses went on, played for um, Chelsea, um, playing for Inter Milan now. I was, I, was fortunate, I was fortunate to be his teammate at Crystal Palace as well. I saw his development through and obviously when he came to Wigan, he was um, yeah, a magnificent player. You know, Talented, score goals, take people on. Hugo Rodriguez is going to be part of my lineup as well. Um, a natural goal scorer. You know, everyone remembers from, for his goal against um, um, Stoke. You know, can run, take people on, score goals, saw some fantastic goals. And yeah. And the, the main man leading the attack would be Emil Heskey. Um, I played against him a couple of times, and he is a, literally a man mountain. Um, you know, everyone remembers him at Wigan for his game against Sheffield United, where he was outstanding, you know, from defence to attack, everything he, you, you, you know, want as a player. So unselfish. And, you know, you hear the compliments that he gets from Michael Owen and Robbie Fowler, where they said he's the best, you know, player that he plays with because he does all the hard work, which people don't notice. So, yeah, for me, he would be my, my main striker. So that is my team, <laughs> the players that I played against. And I, I'd say I played against with many, many good players that could have made easier and made another, another team out of it. You can make a full swan of some of the great names you played with in that team. Hopefully, we'll hear some of their stories on the podcast. I know you're close friends with Emil Heskey, just to name a few. Leon Barnett, someone who you see as a little brother, and uh, it'll be great to hear some of their stories. And, and this podcast will be great to hear the stories of so many ex professionals who might not have spoken about some of the things they'll discuss on this podcast. So, I definitely recommend subscribing to our YouTube, following our Spotify. It's a great channel, and I know this podcast too is sport based, but we'll also discuss general life issues and, and something that is close to your heart, Emerson, is the recent events of Black Lives Matter, uh, the campaign which we've been seeing on, which initially started in America, but it's hit worldwide now, and, and it's an issue that I'm glad is being raised and education is being founded. And Emerson, can you just talk about this campaign and what it means to you? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, you know, we saw the march um, on Friday. Uh, you know, I think it's 57 years since uh, Martin Luther King made that famous speech, and we're still talking about it today, which is um, to show you how far we have progressed. And don't get me don't get me wrong, um, we have made made strides. Um, kick it out, you know, some of the campaigns that are going on, show racing red card, kick it out. Um, 
and obviously Black Lives Matter has come to the forefront at this minute in time. Um, you know, as a player, I, 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 I witnessed abuse, you know, racial abuse as a player and from, from players and from fans. So, you know, it is part of society. Um, and I'm just hoping that this movement, this, this is not just, um, the message doesn't get lost. I hope it's a movement that continues and, and is some high profile um, people um, are behind this campaign. We saw the NBA players, you know, take a stand. Uh, the, the Premier League players or football in general is making a stand regarding taking a knee. So here's um, a, a topic that's going to be going on. I had a conversation with my son the other day who witnessed um, racial abuse when he was younger. Um, and he's only 14 now, you know. And, and you know, what hurt me at the, at the time was um, the school never did nothing. You know, I was in a fortunate position to be able to, be able to move my kid from um, one school to another. He was only about six or seven at the time when it happened to him. And, you know, he came home, didn't want to... He came home, didn't want to wear... Uh, wanted to wear hats all the time because he wanted to cover his hair. He wanted to blink all the time because his, his, um, his eye colour was different. And obviously he wanted to be a different colour because people were teasing him about his colour of his skin. And as a parent, this is heartbreaking to hear. Um, and it is a key message now where... I had to have that talk. My parents had to have that talk with me. And I'm just hoping and praying that he hasn't got to do the same talk to his kids um, when, when, when he has children of his own or any of my, or of my children. So it is a, is a, you know, it's a pity that we're still talking about this, this day and age. I think change is coming. Um, but again, you know, you look at the uh, recent events, you know, especially in America, you know, as a young kid myself, Growing up in Ellsbury, I was getting stopped, you know, for no reason. And we used to make it a joke. How we dealt with racism on the football pitch, um, I was quite lucky. I had um, a, a lot of black players that were playing with me. You know, Andre Scarlett, Nathan Abbey, Stuart Douglas, Liam Jaws, Steve Augustine, to name a few. And when we got racial abuse on, on, from fans, we used to laugh it off. You know, got called Jaffa Cake and, and you know, monkey and monkey chant and all that sort of stuff. So this was this is we're not even talking that long ago when we actually break it all down, um, but that was our way of dealing with it. And I suppose society's changed now, where you know in my area it was a case of I'm going to prove people wrong. I'm going to play even harder. That was my drive. But it is good that now people are saying, do you know what? We don't need to try and you know outdo people being racist to us. Actually, we're going to make a stand now and make changes and. It's a massive, it's a, a fantastic movement, and hopefully, fingers crossed, things will change. How much did you appreciate to see, obviously, when the Black Lives Matter was at its height, the the Premier League and EFL all got involved as well with the players taking the knee before matches. I know Black Lives Matters was on the back of players' shirts as well. How nice is it for you, as a former player who has suffered racial abuse, to see that football is united to take a massive stand? We've obviously we've seen kick it out. They've always been big, big advocates of kicking it out of the game, and it's nice to see that the solidarity in ending racism. Yeah, I think the message has always been there, but now it's been highlighted because now things have been caught on camera. Um, you know, obviously George George Floyd was um, a massive one. Jacob Blake just happened recently, um, and it is a case of now. Um, you know, some of the leaders that lead some of the countries have, have come out publicly and. Some of the comments they've made has not been great. Um, but we are looking for change. And, you know, for me, my point of view is I hope this message doesn't get lost because we've had campaigns in the past and, the, and it gets filtered out. And this why it's, this, this Black Lives Matter is, is, is so important where we, we see the whole world coming together. You know, it's not just a little pockets now it happens for a month and then disappears. The whole world is coming together and united. And that's, a, a, for me, it's a beautiful picture where... Everybody wants change now, not just a, a few groups or a little campaign. Everybody is striving for change. And, you know, we got it from every single country that's trying to do it. So this movement is happening. Um, you know, important voices are being heard. Um, opinions are being um, um, shared. And education is based on education. I'm, I'm educating my children now because I believe education starts at home. And we impact our children. So if everybody's doing the same thing and, and impacting their own children, it makes the world a better place and, and, and goes with equality.
absolutely. I think this is what we're going to strive to achieve. And, and it's not just racism as well. It's, it's other issues such as the LGBT community. I know they've been campaigning against homophobia. And I think once the issues of homophobia and racism are, are out of the question, we'll have a lot friendlier place and a lot less hostile atmosphere where people are discriminated against for, for reasons that shouldn't affect your, your beliefs about a person. Because at the end of the day, we're all the same people. Although, although we've all got different lives, we're all the same in terms of who we are. and We've all got the same mindset, how we all naturally want to be kind to each other. And I think on this podcast, it's going to be great to hear the stories of some other players who have unfortunately suffered abuse in, in terms of racism and hear their thoughts on the Black Lives Matter. Because I think the more we talk about it, the more, the, we, the more we educate, then the more of a chance we have of eliminating it from society. And on this podcast, it, it's going to be great to hear some of the stories from yourself. Obviously, we've we've touched upon some of your aspects of your career, but we're going to develop them further in future podcasts with conversations with your former teammates, telling the stories behind the scenes and the changing rooms, all sorts of football fans I've never heard before. And to end the podcast, we're going to actually have a bit of trivia, a fan question for you to answer in the comments. So the question for this episode of the Emerson Boys podcast is as follows. Which player did Ben Watson come on to replace in the 2013 FA Cup final for Wig Athletic? It's not multiple choice, no Googling, you're only spoiling it for yourself. And uh, the winner who answer will pick at random will be mentioned in the podcast. So feel free to submit your answers. I'm sure you'll all know the answer to this one because Ben Watson did come on in the FA Cup final and do something pretty special. I think you might recall what he did. I know Emerson recalls what he did in that game. So uh, it'll be great to have that involvement. And we are looking to get fans involved in the future too. Emerson, can you shed a bit of light how you want to involve Wigan Athletic fans and other fans of clubs you play for? Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll be inviting fans on as a special guest. Um, they'll, as you say, there'll be a quiz. Um, whoever gets the quiz right, um, out of draw the hat, um, they'll be invited to come on to the show and, and, and be able to um, ask their favourite player or player that played for their club um, a question. So... We, as Dan's saying, this podcast is more about um, bringing the fans together with the players, ex-players, and you know, sharing their experience from a plans, fans' point of view and a player's point of view. So, yeah, so I'm looking forward to the, the, the future episodes where we've got the captain log, um, we'll be getting captains on, strikers, wingers, all different aspects of the game. So it'll be very, very good in terms of um, the episodes that are coming up. I think this is a really unique opportunity for fans to get involved because... I, I'm not sure if other people have seen many ex-footballers who actually invite fans on podcasts. It's usually quite inclusive, so we're giving you an open chance now to meet some of your heroes, ask them the questions you've been dying to know throughout the years of being a football fan. I think it's going to be really special, so I'd like to thank you so much for watching, and I'm sure Emerson will say the same. It's been a great first podcast. This has just been a little bit of an introduction of, of what we plan to bring with the podcast, a bit, a bit about ourselves, and obviously about the Ashton Town move too. If you want to catch Emerson at Ashton Town, if you follow Ashton Town on Twitter, there'll be details about games Emerson will be playing in. I'm sure he'll make a huge success there. So Emerson, if you'd like to end the podcast and, and say your thank you note, uh, this has been Jay Whittle and I thank everyone for watching this and thanks for all the support. Thank you for everybody for watching the, the first episode of the Emerson Boys podcast. Keep safe, keep to the, the, the social distancing and stay safe. <clears throat> Emerson out. I'd like to thank Martin Roach Consultancy for sponsoring this podcast.